job rider was exceptional. Do you know shit about boxing? The very first edition of You Don't Know Shit About Boxing. New podcast from the team that brought you seconds out. We're here with Georgia Banks. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to be talking about a different topic uh, related to the world of boxing every week, as well as current events going on in the sport. Um, but first, it's time to meet our first guest. The challenger, John the Gorilla. <laughs> Welcome, John Ryder. Thank you for having me on your uh, maiden voyage. It is the maiden voyage. Who better to steer the ship? I know, I was going to bring a bottle of champagne and you know, do the uh, ceremonial <laughs> smash, but I thought it would probably be off your head, wouldn't it? So it was the Sainsbury's next no, door. I mean, <laughs> what's going on? We've got the bottled water to prove it. John, we, we last saw you back in action only a couple of weeks ago. Tight but well-deserved win, in my view, over Danny Jacobs. What, what are your reflections on it now? Um, well, great for expectations for your show. <laughs> before I get that in there. <laughs> but um, looking back to the 12th of Feb, yeah. Um, a good good fight I went in there against. And I feel like i done well and, and one convinced me. Obviously, you're going to have your, your naysayers and your bit of uh, negative feedback. But listen, I'm on to the next one now. I'm looking forward to what's next. Now, we saw uh, a fight on the weekend that reminded me, certainly at the end, of your fight with Callum Smith. Um, but I want to ask Georgia first of all, because we were talking about this off camera. What, what was your reaction when the decision went to Josh Taylor rather than Jack Catterall at the end? Um, I was so angry. I was sat shaking. Like, my full body, like, when I get angry, I just kind of see red and I get a bit ragey. Road oh, rage, so like... shaking or just shaking? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I'm. I was quite shocked. Um, I think everybody was, though. It wasn't something that I saw coming at all. What did you think of it, John? Because obviously you've been there. You felt you'd done more than enough against Callum Smith. The decision didn't go your way. For me, watching Taylor Catterall, that seemed even more of a clear victor than in your fight. Yeah, but to be honest with you, I was half expecting it. I was sat there and I thought, I think at six rounds I had Jack Catterall 5-1 up. Um mm. Yeah, same. Actually. That's taken nothing away from Josh. I mean, great fighter. Um, but I just thought Jack had the, the tactics spot on. And um, what better when you're fighting a southpaw than to have Jay Moore in your corner giving you tactical advice and, and working for a camp? I mean, he's been a career long southpaw, fought ever many southpaws. So a perfect coach for, for that kind of fight. But um, yeah, when the scorecards were read out, I just thought crazy. I mean, um, Taking enough, like I say, taking nothing away from Josh. He's a, he's a quality fighter and a, and a lovely man. Same with Jack, but it's doing no good for the sport. It's not Josh's fault. It's um, the way the judges are seeing it. But how are they seeing it? It's so different from the way everyone else is. Well, yeah. I mean, what 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 was your reflection when it happened in your fight with Callum? I know it was close, but to see them all go in his favour, and I think one was pretty wired as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, for me, as sick as a dog. Um, horrible feeling, but. I think in the days after you can take a lot of credit from things like that and you are you are known as the people's mm -hmm. champ and, and whatnot and mm -hmm. listen it's, it's heartwarming that people get behind you and support you mm -hmm. but you're never going to get you you are going to get another world title shot for sure and, and jack i'm sure jack will become a world, world champion but he's never going to get that night again the chance mm -hmm. to become undisputed and do it on a way mm -hmm. soil um and listen there's no easy fights for jack now you've got uh, ramirez against um I'm not sure he's fighting in a couple of weeks' time, but there's going to be no easy fights for him if it's for a vacant title. But he's good enough to do it, and he proved that on Saturday night. Did you, when it happened to you, did you ever expect anything to be done about it, either by the Board of Control or the WBA or anyone? I think um, I think Tony put an email into the WBA, and I think they said for us to consider it, you got to spend, you got to give us ten thousand dollars or something to, for the appeal for the appeal process, and it was more like. Is it, is it really worth it? Is it going to change much? And we obviously knew that Cameron Smith was, the days were numbered at, at 168. Um, he did get the Canelo fight in between. So listen, you know you know deep down, um, it's all very well Jack going through appeal processes and, and throwing money at the problem. But you know in your heart of hearts that Josh is going to move up to 147 mm -hmm. there and, and look for big fights there. And that kind of leads us to our question of the week. We want to hear from you guys. Um, Twitter, you can get us at Seconds Out Live. 
um, also on the live chat on YouTube as we do this. We want to know, how would you solve the UK's judging woes? We've seen a lot of uh, suggestions in the past few days, including from Jake Paul, which I know George is a fan of. I quite like he's, he's grown on me. Yeah, at first I was a bit like, he's, he, I wasn't really sure what he contributed to the sport. And now I'm all for him. Yeah, no, I think I did see his tweets there and I thought um, a reasonable uh, alternative. Um, Was it three pairs of judges? Mm. Three pairs of judges, six judges, but they've both got to agree. And if not, they have to have a little... They've got to bicker it out for 60 seconds, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you said that with loads of 10, 10 rounds? Just so they're not married couples, yeah, the judges, eh? <laughs> yeah, that'd be interesting. Now, our topic this week, because we, we obviously wanted to talk about um, Taylor and Catterall, but our main topic this week is on changing trainers. Now, not the trainers you wear on your feet, John, yeah. even though I'm not in the uh, Nike Air Club today, no, no, unfortunately. Jordan, Jordan yeah. gang. Um, but changing trainers, the man or woman, although we don't see it very often, in your corner. Um, big fight coming up as we record this now is Lee Wood and Michael Conlon, um, and we're going to be focusing on that a little bit. And they've both changed trainers um, Wood a lot more recently than Conlon. And John, you changed trainers quite early in your career only because your long-time trainer was uh, retired, basically. Yeah, I mean, um, I think it was seven years ago now I, I made the switch. And um, to be honest, uh, my, my previous trainer, we, we had a good good work relationship. Um, he taught me a lot, took me through the amateurs, um, took me up to my first 16 pro fights, the British title. Um, but I think the time for change come at the right time could have possibly come earlier and I'm I'm now working with Tony Sims for obviously the past seven years and listen the um, my record's not showing it but I feel we've gone from strength to strength um, a great trainer a great man great mentor and I feel like really steered my career in the right direction how did that come about with Tony Sims well he always managed my career um, he's managing me when I first turned pro mm. I met Tony when I was first 16 um, sparring the pros down Lennox Lewis gym in Hackney and um, yeah just uh, been sparring Darren mm. Bark when I was 18 and just knowing him ever since but just yeah worked with him as my, my manager and I think when it, when it comes to me looking for a, a new trainer it was just a, a simple and easy move to naturally just go with him yeah we naturally clicked um, always got on never never a bad word between us and it's, it remains the same it's good to hear, it's good to hear. Did you already have a, a full beard then at 16? I was born with a full beard. Um, so yeah, Lee Wood and Michael Conlon, um, yep. as we recall this, it's just over a week away. Uh, Lee Wood recently changed trainer to Ben Davison. He's obviously someone that's been in the news quite a lot recently, especially with a Josh Taylor result. You were at Ben's gym not too long ago, I believe, sparring Mark Dickinson, yep. you were telling me earlier. What what do you make of Ben? What sort of impression do you get from being around him? It's it's funny because um, I think the last time I was at the, the the gym with Ben was the day after the comments about trainers in Britain had come out. And um, oh yeah, for people that don't know, I'm sure most people watching this do. But Ben Davison was on. I think it was Talksport, and he was saying that he outworks other trainers, and I think he said they were lazy. But he said it it got quoted out of context. I think yeah, no, we, um, we we had a laugh about it, and he explained it better. And I just thought to myself, if if only you'd have explained it to me the way you did. If, if you'd have done it the other way around, you'd have been um, a lot better off and saved yourself a lot of stick. But listen, he's a, he's a young coach. He's he's making waves. He's doing well, and he's got he's got a good stable to, to back it up. Yeah, I know Lee always talking about him in glowing terms about how he's changed his career. He felt like when he uh, lost to Jazza Dickens, he didn't really have a game plan in place, and now he's got uh, Ben Davison and his team around him as well. Yeah, and I think if you look at Lee Wood's career, I think for a long time it was pretty stagnant and. I mean, a lifetime ago, he lost to Gavin McDonald for the British title, and it seems like he's a, uh, I won't say a resurgence, but it's like a, a new career to him, and he's he's mm. gone and really upset the apple car by beating Zoo Khan, and yeah, um, I did say it right, did I? Zoo Khan, is it? Can Zoo, Zoo Khan. Oh, can you oh. say it? Can <laughs> Zoo say it? Zoo, zoo Khan, <laughs> Zoo Khan, Zoo, yeah. Um, but a, a fantastic win, and listen, it's... Um, it's unfortunate that in the first defence you've got to come up against someone like Mick Condon, who's an mm. unbelievable talent. Um, and listen, a real 50-50 fight. Mick Condon is a bit of a strange one because he turned pro out in the US with Manny Robles, who you wouldn't associate with Conlon's style necessarily. Yeah, strange, strange matchup, I suppose. But he was um, he was heavily out in in the states fighting on top rank. Um, 
but yeah, I think a sensible move now to add them both, and we'll we'll see what he's been working on and how he's improved. What, what do we think of Adam Booth as a trainer generally? He's, his fighters all seem to have a, a similar sort of attributes. Yeah, I think um, I think Mick will fit into that mould pretty well. Um, listen, he's got the skills to, to to do what he wants, turn a fight on his head at any time. So um, I'm sure we're we're in there for, for a treat with this fight. But I think it's it's not only the battle of uh, Lee Wood and, and Mick Condon, it's also the battle of the trainers now. Mm. I think that's taken over. It's going to be the, the battle of Adam Booth and uh, Ben Davison. And I'm sure that'll get more attention than the fight will. Well, we'll talk a bit more about uh, Conlon and Wood in a minute. But first of all, let's hear from the two fighters ahead of their massive contest. And you mentioned your kids there. We don't like to get too much into kind of financial aspects of boxing, but just sum up for us, if you can, what difference a win over Kanzu could make to life for you and your family? Yeah, it's definitely life changing. Um, people, I talk about this like, to a lot of people. Um, money don't really motivate me like it does other people. Oh, it's going to change your life and do this and do that, do that. So I think without boxing, I can go and make money. I'm not, I'm not an idiot. Like um, I can do so many different things to make money if I, if I need to. Um, you know, like property and stuff. I've got a little flat and renovated that. I can do, I can do a little most of the work myself, you know. But I think it will change, it will change my life. Mm. Uh, we found it, I think, we were actually home and, and found that Shauna was pregnant. I'm home from my brother's wedding. And, and that's your second child, isn't it? Yeah, that's my second child. And, you know, being out there, just the three of us, it was, it was okay, but it was still tough. You know, you need, you do need a family kind of circle. You can't really do a lot of things when it's just you three. Um, and then obviously I'm a, I'm a family man, I'm, I'm close to my family and, and being away from home was hard. Um, it wasn't nothing to do with the trainer, nothing to do with Manny. Manny's he's still a friend of mine, still a friend of my family, him and my father are in touch regularly. Um, but it was just, you know, uh, I was having a second baby, you need that kind of support system around. Uh, you know, if Sean needs to do something, she has two babies there and, you know, what's she going to do? She can't get there, can't get anywhere and stuck in the house. So I think, you know, we have, we have a great family, both of us, you know, Sean and my say we're both really supportive and, and they help us out an awful lot. So, and especially with me being away in training camp, basically all year. It's, it's, it's she's, she's, she's alone really, so she's basically a single mother for most most of the time. And you know, for for me, I think I had to think of her first and, and think of the babies and think you know with her and and how we're going to get by. You know, be, being alone, I, I don't like leaving her and and especially now leaving her, it's it's, re it's, yeah. it's really hard. But you know, we do have great families, as I say, and they help us out. Also had a question from Jim McDonald, uh, latterly of Coronation Street, apparently, judging by his profile picture. He asks you, John, how do you feel about the difference between having massive public support after the Callum Smith fight, feeling that you were hard done by, and perhaps some a group of fans at least thinking the other way after the Danny Jacobs fight, the kind of the emotional difference between the two? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's a good question because after the Callum Smith fight, you feel like the, the country comes together for you and you feel you feel you feel a lot of love and um appreciation and but listen you, you've obviously gone through a big defeat but it's a you still on a high because of the support and the backing and obviously when you have a close fight like i did with danny jacobs and you get the the negative feedback it's um it's probably a lower point than when you actually have the loss the um the loss you should have you should have won so i think it's a it's a lower position to be in and you feel you feel a lot more hard done by um yeah, it's a, a tough time, probably. And we were talking before the break about Ben Davison. You said about the battle of the trainers. A lot's been made recently of Ben Davison not being on a brilliant run. There was Lee McGregor's draw not too long ago. Josh Taylor, most people felt he shouldn't have got the decision on Saturday. How much do you kind of look at form when it comes to trainers rather than just for boxers? Is that a thing? Uh, I think it's unfair. I think you always, listen, I think, Joe Gallagher went on a run of 48 wins or something oh, yeah. a few years ago and a lot was said about that but listen it's boxing and when, when the best are fighting the best you, you lose some fight so I mean let, let Lee McGregor had a draw um, up from what I hear I didn't see the fight but he, he should have won um, and the, I think Josh's main problem is is the weight now I think he's he's being beat at the weight and I think that's that's showing his performances I've taken nothing away from um, Jack Carroll he boxed an amazing fight Saturday night. Him and Jamie and Nigel got the tactics spot on. Um, normally it's dangerous for a, a short southpaw to take a shoulder roll. 
<laughs> stance against a taller southpaw, but he done it to perfection. Took Josh's backhand away from him, and um, yeah, made it a hard night's work. So, fair play. Were you making notes? I wasn't. But I just <laughs> see, uh, see you doing the Philly uh, <laughs> shell in your next fight. <laughs> no, I was seeing with a with a tight Philly shell, yeah. Um, and just really took, I think, Josh threw a couple of the left hands, but they was running the back of the head and got warned about it early. So negated that and took that away from him. So listen, Jack stuck to his game plan and executed it to perfection. Do you think the weight drain was so much for Josh on Saturday night that that was his main downfall? It's hard to say. I think um, I think it played a massive part. Mm. Um, also, I think it was hard. A lot of Josh is a high high work mm. rate kind of fighter and. Listen, when he was getting close, he was being tied up and, and Jack was slipping on the inside and, and working away. So it was a tough fight, but I think the weight played a massive factor. Mm, definitely. What makes Tony the right trainer for you? Not yeah. just what makes him a great trainer, but for you specifically? Well, I think after, well, um, early doors, you, you never know, but as time goes on, I think we've got a, a good understanding of each other. I think he knows me probably better than I know myself. Um, he knows when to, to push me on to pull me back a little bit, when to give me a hard time and tell me that I'm useless and really, really play the mind games. <laughs> do that often? Or? <laughs> well, odd, odd times, Tony's a, I think Tony's the king of mind you games. You forget to pay your subs. <laughs> I think Tony's a master of um, knowing when to push and knowing when to pull back. He's uh, he's really finessed the art of uh, is it nature and nurture. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the likes of Barker, myself, Cheeseman, everyone will be able to, um, to vouch for that. Is Cheeseman coming back or is he done now? Who knows? Exclusive. Who knows? I, I've, um, I'm, Ted talks about Ted's business. I, I, I just That's just me not in the loop, not knowing. Um, but listen, Ted, Ted's a young man, successful businessman outside of boxing. Um, obviously now 25. He's going to be the oldest 25-year-old you've ever met. Um, but listen, wow. He <laughs> won't talk about his business, but you can chuck shade at him. No, no listen, he's... Um, Listen, he's, he's an old head on young shoulders, but um, <laughs> he's sensible, he's he's shrewd, he's clever. So, listen, he, he doesn't need to box, but mm. I don't know if the, the desire still burns, and he will. Mm. I'd yeah. like to see him back, but that his last fight was brutal. That yeah, was a tough defeat, mm. yeah. Very tough. Mm. Now, John will be answering some more of your questions when we come back. But first, we're going to go over to Lean Josh Green out in the green room. Thank you very much guys. Um, today I'm going to run through a few of the fighters from the elite level of the sport that have switched trainers throughout their career. There's been many over the years and there's no better place to start than just a week or so ago with Amir Khan and Kel Brook. Both fighters have had multiple trainers throughout their career. In fact Kel Brook's had around four uh, trainers during his career. Dave Caldwell was involved early on, John Fuchs as well. Um, despite spending a huge amount of time with Dominic Ingle and Brendan Ingle of course as well throughout his career who he went to back to of course for his recent fight with Amir Khan. He actually trained with Carlos Pimental for his fight over in the States with Terence Crawford um, after defeat there came back and obviously trained for his fight with Khan last weekend with Dominic Ingle once again. Um, his opponent Amir Khan uh, very linked up with, with Freddie Roach for much of his early career and in the, the recent fight uh, he switched trainers a couple of times but in the recent fight with Kel Brook was with Brian McIntyre uh, more commonly known as Bo Mack of course uh, and if Khan does decide to make a return which is looking fairly unlikely now you would have to say uh, you'd imagine that Bo Mack would be in the corner Elsewhere, George Groves, um, early in his career with, with Adam Booth, but split in 2013. Um, and then was with Paddy Fitzpatrick until 2015. Um, actually split at short notice um, from Adam Booth um, in the in the lead-up to his first fight with, with Carl Froch. Uh, Tyson Fury as well, who can forget the heavyweight champion of the world. He was with... Ben Davison uh, earlier in his career, but switched to Sugar Hill Stewart uh, just, I believe, a couple of weeks, a uh, couple of months rather, for uh, prior to his fight with his second fight with Deontay Wilder. Um, obviously, a switch that proved a very fruitful one um, in the second and the third fight, and he'll be in the corner once again when Tyson faces Dillian White in April. Uh, elsewhere, AJ Anthony Joshua, of course. Um, earlier in his career, right at the start of his career, was with Tony Sims, but aligned with 
Rob McCracken for the majority of his career up until that defeat with, uh, against Alexander Usyk just a short few months ago. Um, no word yet who is going to be in the corner for for the rematch with that fight. Um, we know he was out in gyms, he was at the Kronk gym, he, he was with Eddie Reynoso, so um, could be anyone. We, we hope to hear confirmation of that soon. Uh, and from the weekend, of course, Josh Taylor was with the McGuigans, Barry and Shane McGuigan, early on in his career, but um, obviously switched to Ben Davis and has had much success over the last year or two. Um, the obviously controversial result over the weekend. I'm sure he'll be working with, with Ben for many years to come. Thank you very much, and I'll hand it back to you guys. Thanks, Josh. Really appreciate that. Georgia, you've got the uh, some of the responses to the question of the, or the big question. I think we're we're going to call it. And now you've got your phone out as well, just so everyone knows, just so boxing guru can have a go at you and all. <laughs> share Please the burden. Don't have a go at me. I'm have sensitive. a go. At her. She can take it. <laughs> I'm sensitive, so go on. Okay, so Max has said a VAR type system. Anything hugely marginal from the other judges or mathematically questionable, then each round a review on VAR by an independent panel. <laughs> And they can be overturned if they need to be, which, yeah, I can't he see He kind of lost not. me halfway through, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of big part? words in there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mathematically unquestionable. <laughs> yeah, both of those. Um, yeah, how do you feel about a VAR system? It's working blind in the Premier League, isn't it? So, uh, why not? John's an Arsenal fan. <laughs> yeah. No, do you know what? I feel, listen, it's been a, it's been a long-standing problem, Um I'm going somewhere at this point, but I've forgotten. Um, <laughs> Is it to mathematical and questionability? Not, not just questionability, I think, yeah. <laughs> um, just how... Are the, are the judges sat in the wrong position? Could they be sat somewhere else from a, with a better view, better perspective of the fight? Um, in the job they, centre, should, perhaps. Should they be backstage watching it on monitors like people at home? Um, hmm? it's, it's a tough one. It's just because they are seeing it so differently to everyone else at home. Or like an extra judge maybe who does look at a monitor to like split the difference in, in rounds where people don't agree. I don't know. Yeah, I mean it's harder because I think obviously going back to the, the the Jake Paul tweet, if you had six judges, I know you've got them working in twos, but is that gonna cause are you gonna have punch ups at the judges' tables? <laughs> you know I mean, are you gonna have two really going at it because they don't agree or Or delays as well. Yeah, delays with that. Or if you have six judges, are you gonna end up with more draws? It's, um Listen, for, for, for how many of years now it's worked with three judges? Um, we had three very good referees at the judges' table on Saturday night, mm. but questionable scorecards. Well, they're um, very much different skills, aren't they? I think referee yeah. and judge. Should, should referees be judges and, or should we just have dedicated referees judges, and yeah. dedicated judges? That's not a bad idea. It's worth having you on. <laughs> Marcus said that he'd like a publication from the British Boxing Board of Control on how they advise their judges to score a fight mm. and what categories they deem most relevant. Have you ever had anything like that from no. the board, like as a fighter? No, not that I know of. But you do hear that American judges score for more aggression. Um, yeah, so what is there? There should be a. Like a set criteria. Yeah, there should yeah. be a criteria of what you, you've you got to do. I mean, which is not fair because if you're a counter puncher, then you're not going to be the aggressor. <laughs> yeah. um, Go back to Jordan Gill last night. He spent however many rounds on the ropes and pulled out a peach of a punch and knocked out, shot, his, yeah. uh, knocked out his opponent on, which was a yeah great shot. But um, I mean, he was obviously very behind on the scorecards at that point. But so how, how would you... How would you do it if someone's a counter puncher? You, they're not going to be getting points for aggression, are they? So it's it's a it's a tough one. Mm. What else we got? Um, I think the judging criteria needs to be changed with things such as total punches landed, taking more priority over things like ring generalship. So judges aren't given the benefit of the doubt and excuses as to why they thought a fighter won. Did you make it out, John? Put you on well, the spot. I think yeah, I think so they're going to be judging your fights punch, in the future. Punch totals are not. The, the true reflection of a fight it doesn't matter that someone's peppered you with 30 shots and you've only landed 10 if they're more 10 more meaningful shots clean then, heavier yeah clean heavier then they have more of an effect on the opponent then surely that should be the winner of the round not someone who's landed the, the 30 pitter patter shots what do you think about like a lot of people ask for in football and doesn't always happen but the referees and in this case the judges coming out to explain them to themselves and how they came to their decision I think it would be 
it's I suppose a good thing and a bad thing, I suppose, as if they're they're putting themselves on social media channels such as yourself and others. Um, <laughs> others that just, we won't name. <laughs> they're opening <laughs> themselves up for more more stick and um, more abuse. And listen, they're they're all getting abused today and will be for the coming weeks. They're going to have to justify themselves to Robert Smith and the board. So <sighs> fair, that, that's a fair thing to do. Um, but I think opening their personal lives up to abuse on social media is a bit much and but i do agree that to some extent they should be made to justify a decision and listen people might see and understand my warm why they, why they scored it that way in in, in the heat at the moment mm. do you think we as fans will ever truly be happy with a decision mm, interesting. on a whole especially in a close fight mm. i don't know it's, it's tough i mean you have your when the final bell goes, like my fight with Danny Jacobs, I've when the final bell went, I felt like a winner. I knew in my heart of hearts that I'd won. I've been in close fights before where I've been a bit like, I don't know. Mm. It, it, and listen, you, you, you can tell, but on February 12th, I knew that I was the winner. I was victorious. And listen, I'm, I'm, I get stick for it now. And it was a close fight, another robbery. But like I say, I, I now know what it feels like to be on the other end of the, the robbery. And it's this is it's a mm. not I won't say hurtful, but it's you want to shine in your glory, and uh, it's, it gets taken away from you a bit. Mm. Now we're gonna have some questions for you. Yep. Um, from the <laughs> from the fans out there. I'm not looking forward to this. I'm not being briefed. <laughs> <laughs> Go easy on me, please. Have, have some water. Yep. Hydrate yourself first. This is quite a long one anyway. I might Question. have to start on your one yeah. if it gets that bad. <laughs> My what? <laughs> no, I'm just uh, I'm just checking. Um, would like to. This is from Mark Jones. Should give him his credit. I haven't read the question yet, though. Uh, would like to ask John who he wants next. Don't want to see him wait about for Canelo. I'm sure you don't want to wait about either. The fight with Morel would be perfect. That's one that nearly happened last year, of course. What What are you saying? Who's Who's next? Um, well, well, he's meant to start this at five o'clock. So whoever delayed it would be <laughs> next to my list. Yeah. On my radar. <laughs> <laughs> Only joking. <laughs> As they're still in the room. Everyone's, no one's <laughs> running for the door, so I'm only joking. Um, Listen, whatever fight makes most sense, obviously I'd love to fight Canelo. He's the, the man of boxing. Um, as a fan, um, I, I like what he's doing next. I think the fight with Bivol's good, the, the Glovkin free, but I would love my shot. But it's, it's a real, I'm, in a, I'm, I'm in a tough position. It's, um, there's no vacant belts. Um, I'm not going to get a vacant shot. The fight with Morel, Morel sorry, makes sense. Um, we was there twice last year and First night it got pulled from underneath me and then we looked at another alternative with fighting Bivol, but that didn't happen. So I, I'm open. I hope to have a sit down with Eddie soon and um, yeah, map out, map out path then. A similar question from Jack Howes on our Instagram page. He says, what is the one fight, one fight? I don't know where that came from. <laughs> what is the one fight you want before you retire and where would you want that fight in the world? Well, I think Canelo would be nice at Wembley. Yeah. Yeah. Arena? No. <laughs> no conference you know, still, still yeah. standing but yeah the, the wings of the ghost centre uh, ghost centre the conference <laughs> centre that once was and a bit of a, a left field one from Pidge yep. I don't know if that's his real name Pidge how many seven year olds I don't know why it's seven year olds specifically <laughs> but how many seven maybe they're really tough you yeah. know how many seven year olds do you think you could beat in a boxing match at one time before they overpowered you? It, can I see this is because I've got a seven year old daughter, so I just want to make sure it's not someone like a, <laughs> another another parent from the class. Oh, um, right. Listen, I get bullied daily by a seven year old girl. Just one. Just one. Bullied daily. I've not once made turn it physical. So I couldn't <laughs> I, I couldn't, so I couldn't <laughs> tell you. You took the moral high ground there, mate. But mentally, um, she's victorious every day of my life and even the two-year-old is, is getting the better of me most days you are talking about your children right not just like random, just some random yeah, my, my children. Okay. <laughs> yeah. just my children yeah <laughs> it's good to know i'm just seeing if there's anything on the live chat but we'll we'll come back to that in a minute um so soon we are going to give you some even tougher questions yeah. than the ones that come from our audience george is going to be the one okay interrogating that you that, chair's for? that, that is what like, that big yeah. chair's for uh, it's not mastermind. It looks like mastermind, yeah. Gutted. Chosen subject. Yeah. What would it be, actually? Um, Come on, you're on the spot now. I don't know. Boxing robberies, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Fair I've, enough. I've been, on, I've been on the right end, I've been on the wrong end as we go by recent form. So uh, we'll talk about that. Yeah, maybe we'll do that next time. Yep. Um, but yeah, so after we come back, 
John will be in the hot seat and Georgia will be the one with the spotlight shining in his face. Job rider was exceptional. Do you know shit about boxing? Okay, Mr. John Ryder. This game is called The Worst People in the World. So, obviously, you have to just pick the first one or the second one. Okay. People who hog gym equipment and sit on their phone, or people who spar like they're competing and injure others? Uh, people who spar like they're competing and injure others. People who put clips on Smith machines or people that don't wash their wraps ever? Um, people that put clips on Smith machines. <laughs> Just uh. People that pretend to be out of breath when they're on their way out of the gym or people that stand way too close to you when you're skipping and keep catching you? People that are definitely people that stand too close to you when you're skipping and you keep catching them. People that keep talking to you through circuits, just that nagging in the back of your ear, or cyclists riding two abreast on country roads. I'm going to have to go with a cyclist here. Um, it's a subject close to my heart. They've got cycle lanes with barriers and they still want to ride on the road. <laughs> People who don't put their weights back in the gym and leave them all over the floor, or people who post really vague statuses on social media. Like, ah, oh, tagged myself in hospital, but won't say anything else. Yeah, I really like, grinds on me that. Um, just like, yeah, like why, why have we got to read between the lines? You're putting this status up. Just tell us what's happening. Are you alive? Are you okay? Not just, um, not you don't, we don't just want to message you and find out. We're not nosy. We are nosy. <laughs> But we want you to elaborate more. We don't want to have to ask a question. <laughs> you just want to read it. Yeah. People who eat with their mouths open or people that don't bring a towel to training. We're lucky. We've got a, uh, Tony's put a, um, a, a, a towel full of drawers, a drawer full of towels in, in the gym. So we, um, we have to take them, wash them and put them back. Um, but yeah, mouth eaters with a wide open mouth, you can see what they're eating and they're talking to you and Glad you're it. often um, wearing a bit of it afterwards. <laughs> people that kick the spit bucket and stir up the smell or people that leave empty water bottles on the side of the ring? Well, due to COVID, we've got no spit buckets in our gym now. Um, it's a spit free zone. And we are sticklers for putting our our, um, our empty water bottles in the bin. Tony doesn't like the water bottles laying around, so we are, we are always checking ourselves not to leave them on the side of the ring. Tony's gym sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> People who phlegm in the sink and don't wash it away, or drivers that don't wave thank you when you let them out. Drivers that don't wave thank you. I think it's um, if I'm stopping, slowing down, taking time out of my day to let you go, I'd appreciate a, a nod a wink or just a high five <laughs> perfect and that ladies and gentlemen is John Ryder's worst people in the world wow that is going to be controversial Paul well, John Ryder was exceptional do you know shit about boxing that was good stuff, guys. Um, Nick Kerr on our live chat said he really enjoyed the segment. So, well done, sure. first of all. Normally, on my Instagram, I do the worst polls you could ever imagine. And oh, I feel really? like we might need to give it a few more episodes to break into that. Okay. Um, they're, they're, they're a bit much. But, um... It was a bit tough when you asked me the question about people being on their phone and I glanced <laughs> at him. Danny was there. On his phone. Like playing Candy Crush. <laughs> swiping. Well, I, don't know, was, I don't know why he was swiping. What was you swiping on? I was swiping left only. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but Nick Kerr also asked for you, John, what's the best spa you've ever seen? But I'd um, like to add, what's the one best you've ever also been a part of? Um, I'll tell you who I sparred in LA was, oh, I can't, his name's gone from me, the Russian Olympic heavyweight champion. He was... Jalalov. No, no not super Jalalov. He no. was, he's a cruiserweight now as a pro. Um, I've done four rounds of him in the wildcard gym. Um, I have to trade a picture after, but yeah, absolute mountain. Um, Fred Roach said, yeah, don't worry, you'll be all right. Um, done four rounds and great experience. But the best round, the best spa I've seen, um, tough. I watched, um, I watched Carl Froch by Anthony Small years ago. 
Oh wow, that was that was good. Tough. I see a lot of good spas. Um, I see Ricky Burns spa, Mikey Garcia. Wow, that was good. Um, good, good couple of rounds. Um, we're we're lucky. We've been around the world sparring. Do you know what I mean, we've um, I've done hundreds of rounds with Darren Barker. Um, I've seen Darren Barker spar the likes of Carl Froch. Good fight. So yeah, I've been in and around a lot of good spas. And just one more before we round off. Super J Cole fan. Again, probably not the name on his passport, but he yeah. asks <laughs> which you because he's from America, I think. Yeah, which yeah. UK up and coming prospect should we be looking out for over in the US? Um, well, we've got a lot. We've got a lot of very lot of good pro prospects. Obviously, Galaya Fire made his debut yesterday. Don't know if I could call him a prospect because he's a Olympic champion. Twenty nine, well, twenty nine, yeah. is he? Um, he'll be moved quickly. Chevron Clark, another great talent. Um, We've got a lot of good fighters in this country. Um, British title fight coming up. Um, Linus against Denzel Bentley. Two very good fighters. George Another. is a big fan of Linus. Yep. Why's everyone looking at me? <laughs> the Luton Massive. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're, we're blessed with talent in this country. For us, for a small island, we've got a lot of talent. Obviously, my, my good friend Joe Caldina is going to have a, I won't call him a prospect, but he's going to have a good a, a breakout year, I'd say. And um, even like Felix Cash, he's, he's getting himself out there. And listen, Connor Ben, you know him in the States, he's making waves, but big years for these boys now. Really appreciate you all watching the very first episode of You Don't Know Shit About Boxing. If you feel you do know shit about boxing, please like, comment, subscribe. Can't wait to hear from you. We'll be back in two weeks' time for the next episode where whoever the guest is going to have huge shoes to fill. Well. Wow. If, hopefully I don't get a call up again otherwise you're slacking to get guests struggling yeah. Yeah. we started when this was light by the way it's now dark I'm sorry <laughs> we'll increase we'll double your fee British uh, British time you were yeah. a little bit late true yeah so. we'll, we'll double your fee John that lovely yeah two zeros or what are you getting paid for this I'm <laughs> not well, <laughs> <laughs> you do it for the love <laughs> brilliant need a new agent <laughs> yeah, or an agent <laughs> Really appreciate you watching. We'll see you all in two weeks' time. Wow! That is going to be controversial! Paul Drum Rider was exceptional. You know shit about boxing!